Well, thank you for having me. Um, so today I'll be talking about a visual recognition beyond 2D. And I want to say that um, in, the, in the seven years that I've been doing research, I've only been looking into 2D. Today I'll be, I'll be talking about 3D a little bit, but if I make any mistakes, feel free to correct me. And I'm sure that I will be making many mistakes here. So uh, let's get this started. So 2D visual recognition has actually received a lot of attention. And it started with defining tasks um, a bunch of years ago, all the way from um, digit recognition, which assumes that you take an image of a digit and you're supposed to classify it as being like a zero to nine, all the way into a lot more complex tasks, such as instant segmentation, where you take as input an image and you're supposed to say how many instances of all object categories are where they are and actually mark the spatial extent. And along with these uh, really uh, nice tasks have come also really compelling and large-scale benchmarks, um, all the way from MNIST to more complicated benchmarks like COCO. And the really positive um, outcome from these well-defined tasks and benchmark is that we've seen this really great increase in uh, performance for a lot of our 2D visual tasks. And I'm showing here a bar plot for performance of object detection where in a span of very few years, we went all the way from five percentage points of AP all the way to 50 something. Um, here, the numbers are a little bit outdated. I'm showing only up to late 2017. These numbers have now increased a lot. So um, this path to success, we attribute it, of course, to these very nice test tasks and benchmarks that everybody can download across the world, run their model on, and report performance. But what has come from that is also that we've built really good uh, and robust backbones. These are transferable architectures that even though they were designed to tackle, let's say, image classification, um, they actually are transferred to other tasks. For example, AlphaGo uses a ResNet, which was designed for ImageNet classification. We've also tackled to define a really well, um, like a very effective training recipe, uh, how we optimize this network um, how to make them stable and, um, and effective. Um, and also how to go beyond, um, a, like let's say a single GPU training uh, and how to tune the hyperparameters in order to scale that up and make it even faster. And I wanna mention here that these are, even though these seem to be kind of ad hoc and um, empirical studies, there's actually a lot of science behind tackling exactly how to train these networks. But most importantly, um, what we, what 2D, like researchers in 2D visual recognition have achieved is that they have built representations that tackle uh, the tasks that they, are, um, that they want to address, which means that they actually take care into whether the, these representations have the right properties. So for example, invariance versus equivariance. And it's these representations that we want them to uh, tackle the sources of variation that we have in our visual inputs. And these sorts of variation go all the way from uh, pixel intensities, like uh, photometric intensities, to all the way to semantic variations, such as intra-class variation, or even scene context. And um, to quote my collaborator, Ross Gershik, who is kind of like, you know, the king of object detection, he says that recognition is a science and engineering of models that have effective invariance and equivariance properties. Um, and this is not just a saying that is kind of like, you know, theoretical nonsense. This has actually been a very impactful for our recognition models. And a very shiny example here is the object detection frameworks that we've seen over the years. Um, and I'm gonna give you like a five minute overview of these frameworks. Some of you will know them, so you'll find this boring. But for those of you who are not familiar, it will kind of give you an overview of what these frameworks are all about. So, the state-of-the-art object detection is um, a pipeline that, that consists of two stages. First one is a per-image computation. These are computations that happen at an image level, which are followed by computation that happens at a per-region level. And so given an input image, we, uh, we define a function which projects the image into a, a higher dimensional feature space. At the same time, we also uh, use a, a region proposal uh, mechanism to extract candidates for all the objects in the image. These two representations, the feature space of the image as well as the region proposals get fused together 
um, in order to compute featureized representations for each of the proposals. And these now featureized representations are then processed subsequently by another computation and also task-specific uh, little models in order to predict task-specific predictions. And so this is now a very generalized way of presenting object detection. And for example, faster CNN can be explained with that generalized representation where uh, what you have is the function f is substituted by a fully convolutional network, let's say an AlexNet or a ResNet. And the, the oh, I'm sorry, and the region proposal is just an off-the-shelf uh, region proposal mechanism such as selective search. And these two get together with this operation that's called ROI pool. Faster RCNN can also be explained by this generalized framework, with the only difference from fast RCNN is that now we're not, no longer using an off-the-shelf region proposal, but we're using an actual neural network to predict regions. And again, they come together with the same operation of ROI pool. And here is where these equivariance properties matter. So ROI pool will project a region into the feature maps. And it will actually, and since we're operating on a grid, it will snap it to the nearest grid locations on the image in order to extract the features and then, um, and then transform them into a fixed size feature map, feature vector. Here showing a two by two. And the operation here is a, is a hard binning with a max pull operation. Um, I don't know if you have already identified where some of the equivariant properties are breaking from this definition. If not, I will now explain why. So master CNN is also another framework um, that can be explained by this generalized representation of object detection, where you have your image-based operation, you have your region-wise operation. And these things now get together with this ROI line, which is actually the only difference with faster RCNN. And ROI is now different because it no longer will snap the region into the grid map. It will actually try to use alignment and bilinear interpolation to extract the features from the original feature map into the final vector. And this is now great because ROI was actually breaking this pixel to pixel translation equivariance, while ROI line no longer um, makes any, any such assumptions. There is no quantization performed on the ROIs. There is in, on its bins, nor on its sampling uh, points. Does that, does that make sense? If you have had questions, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, no questions. And now this very small detail that most of us would kind of like gloss over and not pay attention to is the reason for the, this big performance gain from the previous detection models. And it's a gain of five points, like three lines of code made it were so impactful that they created a five point gap in performance. Okay. And it's also the reason, uh, and also the reason why we get all these really nice visualizations that really nicely snap on the contours of the objects because we maintain this image to pixel, um, image to pixel feature um, direction in our computation. And I'm showing here some examples of mass sending. You've probably seen many. So, so what I want you to get from this part of the, of the talk is that actually making sure that what you design has the right properties is important. It's some, not something that you should be glossing over. And it's actually the, the same argument that I use whenever somebody tells me that neural networks are just black boxes. They're not, because in a black box, you wouldn't be thinking about these properties. Um, and this is where actually our job also comes in. Um, so that kind of makes us feel better that we're doing something that's not just, you know, black magic. Um, however, you know, all of us 2D people, um, if we want to claim that we're, we're solving for object understanding, um, we should be thinking about what are the models that we are designing actually predict. And unfortunately, all of these predictions happen in 2D. However, objects exist in 3D, and this is not something I should be uh, making many arguments over. This is very like, straightforward. However, none of our models can actually make any predictions in 3D. If I want to know what the shape of this suitcase is, or which suitcase is in front of another suitcase, um, then our models don't know the answer of that. And we should. We should be answering these questions. And, 
and we should be striving to actually take all these nice uh, advances of 2D object recognition and marrying them with 3D object understanding. And this is gonna be, of course, a very challenging problem. It's not gonna be very easy. First of all, we wanna, because we wanna be doing recognition in the wild. We wanna be tackling all these issues that 2D object recognition is tackling, um, dealing with occlusion, with multiple objects, with clutter. And at the same time, we have to deal with objects of varying topologies, geometries, and types. Um, and if we want to predict shapes, then we want, should be able to be able to, we should be able to predict all these varying uh, geometries of the objects. Plus, now that you know, we were thinking about equivariance in 2D, and now we have to be also thinking about whether our models are equivariant in 3D, which is another added nightmare on top of what we already have to do. Um, and so, and this is, I'm gonna talk about um, our, one of our papers, this is with Jitendra Malik and Justin Johnson, it's called Mesh RCNN. I know we're not branching out in our titles, but it was a good fit. And so in our work, what we wanna do is that we wanna take an input image and we wanna predict all the object shapes. We wanna predict the shapes of all the objects in the image. Um, and we wanna do this in the form of a triangle mesh. And in order to achieve this, of course, we're gonna rely on 2D object recognition, like mask or CNN, in order to recognize all objects in the image. Um, and in order to capture all these varying topologies uh, and all these varying geometries of the objects that we see, we will um, arrive to the object meshes via predicting, um, come on, by predicting object voxels. And voxels are nice because they capture, um, they can capture varying geometries uh, and topologies, but they're, but they're, don't, they're actually a coarse, a coarse shape representation of the objects. So we're gonna refine these object voxels uh, further in order to get these refined object meshes. And we're doing this through this, uh, this, through this uh, pipeline called Mesh RCNN. So as you can see, Mesh RCNN builds on top of Mask RCNN. What you see here, uh, like if you ignore all the part that is being faded away, is actually Mask RCNN. You take an image, you take the ROI line features, and you apply a box and mask branch in order to get the 2D masks, the boxes, and the class of the objects. So we're gonna add on top of that a voxel branch, which will take a, um, which will predict the voxels for every object in the image. And here the voxels are nothing else but a 3D mask. So this is nothing, like the architecture of the voxel branch and the way that we're dealing with, with voxels is just by adding another depth channel to, them, to the masks. But as I said, we want to get to object meshes at the end. So what we do in order to convert these voxels into a mesh is that we're calling this uh, operation called Cubify, which basically transform voxels, like voxel occupancy uh, masks into meshes by uh, merging uh, the shared 3D vertices and also uh, by um, getting rid of any interior adjacent, adjacent faces. And we arrive to this uh, cubified mesh. So for all of you that are more familiar with 3D and, gra and graphics, so this cubify is basically the poor man's uh, marching cubes. Okay, like a very, very simplified version of marching cubes. And as I said before, this, this result of this cubify operation is a mesh, but it's a very coarse shape. It is the structure, the fine structures are not there, it's kind of clunky, so we want to further refine it. And so we do this with this operation that we call, this branch that we call a mesh refinement branch, which will take an input, this initial mesh, and we'll refine it with a sequence of, um, of uh, operations. And these operations come from um, our, what we call vertiline, which will basically take the, verti the vertex positions of the mesh and project them back into image features in order to extract the features from the image that correspond to that particular position on the vertices. And we will then follow, uh, this is followed by a sequence of graph convolutions, the, which operate across the edges of the mesh and on the features that we extracted from the image. And finally, uh, a refinement step which predicts the offsets uh, to, uh, for, every for every vertex in the mesh in order to, um, to, to deform it so that it, is, it now captures better the shape of the object. Okay, 
Right. So, so, so again, the topology is exactly committed to in the voxel branch. So the voxels do capture the topology, which is then not changed, as you correctly point out, in the requirement branch. And what's the function? Oh yes, I will get to that. There is a lot of more. Yes, uh, Ruben. So do you ever use the uh, box and map the output directly, or is, is it just used as a filter to predict? No. So so the boxes are used. The boxes that you predict from mask or CNN are used in order to define, to predict everything else that comes after it. So it follows exactly the object detection pipeline where you predict the objects and then you kind of operate on region per region level. Yeah, but I mean, those are usually predicted by RCN. Right, so everything is predicted jointly, which is the argument. Do you yeah, prefer? So like you're, are you using like mask directly in this? Oh, no, 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 we're not using mass direct, but we're using object detection. Uh, there was another, yes? How are the voxels represented? So, exactly, so the, the voxels are represented, like, it's like 3D masks. So, masks in a three-dimensional uh, cube. And every, and every location is basically a probability, whether it's on and off, based on whether it's occupied or not. Was there another? Yes. Yeah, so is, is the idea with each of the refinement steps is that you start off with a mesh, you have like a mesh that's all along that piece by mesh. Each step you calculate adjustments to each of the mesh points? Yes. Okay, all right. Yeah, so, so basically you start with this, with this initial shape, that cubify outputs, and then you sort of predict how you want to deform every position in the mesh, every, every vertex in the mesh in order to fit, to, to better fit the actual shape. Yeah, so it's an additive thing. Yes, correct. Cool. Yes. Are there particular steps here where it's, you think it's really important to have this CNN architecture, or do you think you could use it as a, a function of box maps or something? Um, so, in which part do you mean? In well, the I whole know, object recognition know. literature, no, or? In this slide. Yeah, in this slide. Um, I mean, basically, we follow. Uh, the sort of the same mindset of what uh, previous people have done for object recognition, which is a fully like a fully convolutional network, uh, and there and of course in theory you can approximate everything with MLP with uh, like fully connected layers in the if you have infinite data um, and infinite capacity. But these assumptions also operate on the fact that convolutions are sort of cheaper and you can learn them with fewer data points. We well, should ask Ian Lacoon. <laughs> um, I, I guess my, my answer is that no, like we don't have any sort of nor theoretical nor empirical comparisons to anything uh, else, but we know that CNNs work much better without having a lot of hand design and by by this end-to-end -end learning that you can learn every every single component connects to another and pro like information flows forward and backward in order to learn everything. Does that make sense? So a lot of, a lot of the gains from having neural network, I mean, now I'm like, I'm gonna go back to explain why maybe CNNs have been so impactful for object recognition, but it's definitely the properties that, they, that come with them. Like they maintain spatial properties you're able to learn all of these filters and all of these representations jointly and without having massive amount of data in order to fit uh, your distributions, your underlying distributions, no matter what they are. I'll come back yes. and, 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 and ask you some you, you should, you should. I mean, these are more like, uh, like I would say, borderline philosophical versus... Well, I do object to that term because you're claiming that you've got scientific insights into the relationship of these hyperparameter manipulations that wondering where those insights are. The insights are mostly empirical. We, 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 I think that this is something that defines us, um, like uh, people in object recognition, is that a lot of our insights come from our empirical gains. ResNets came from a bug. They were not intentionally designed to be like that. Um, it wasn't a theoretical theorem that uh, Kai Ming had and then said, oh, now I'm gonna do residual networks. So a lot of our insights come from, from from things that we sort of try out and see working. 
And I agree with you that this is not necessarily um, very, uh, it's not very good for us. Like we're basically inheriting the next generation with a lot of empirical results without having a lot of scientific insights, but we can't ignore the fact that things perform better. And this is what drives us. I don't know if that makes sense or if I discouraged anybody here. Okay. <laughs> okay, I don't think it was worth an applause, so, but yes, let's chat further. Okay. And, um, and of course now we have to worry again, as I said, about the equivariance and invariance properties. And in 3D, this is actually becoming a lot trickier uh, than in 2D. And this is where I'm going into 3D territory, so really correct me if I'm saying anything wrong. Um, but the reason this is tricky is that our world space is actually like this really like weirdly shaped frustum, which is, very, which is not very close to the, the grids that we are used to predicting when we do image manipulations. And so if we want to maintain these equivariance properties, we have to deal with that. And the way we deal with that is that we transform this frustum space into, into, into grids, into rectangular grids, by using the camera matrix. So all of our predictions are aligned in the prediction space rather in the world space, because this is the only way we can make, we can gap, we can actually bridge the gap between grid-based operations, such as convolutions, with a 3D space. Was that correct? Okay, awesome. Um, and of course the same, um, the same holds not for just the voxels like that we need to predict in this prediction space, but also when we, for vertical line, when we project back 3D positions into image features, we need to take into account the camera matrix so that we align perfectly the position, the vertex position on the mesh to the image location, the pixel location in the image. Okay. Um, and so by this, we maintain all these really nice properties that have seemed to work. And so I'm not going into some uh, nitty gritty details that Costas also asked about what are the losses and what, we, what do we do. So first of all, the voxel, as I said many times, is, has an identical architecture to the mask branch of mask RCNN, with the only difference that we add another channel to predict the, the depth. And the loss is very similar to mask RCNN. It's basically a uh, binary cross-entropy loss. Things again get a little trickier for the shapes. And this is because there is no comprehensive or will define metric to measure the distance between two meshes. Am I, is that correct? I think so, especially differentiable, I'm not aware of any. So what, pe what we do and what a lot of people do in the community is that they actually convert the mesh into a point cloud. And then they, uh, in order to, put to uh, compute a loss, they uh, apply a point cloud specific loss. And so we do the same thing, but this needs to happen in a differentiable way, a part of a network so that we can propagate all the way back. And so what we do is we actually uh, implement a differentiable sampling from the mesh surface so that given a mesh, we can sample points from the surface of the mesh in order to predict this uh, point cloud to approximate the mesh. And then we basically apply um, a chamfer loss on top of the two point clouds. And this Yes, everything is predicted in the, in the, in the world. So we're, ma we're not making canonical predictions. I think this is what you're trying to say. So we're not, we're ma predicting the, in, in the image frame, not in a canonical frame. Uh, right? Uh, and another, another really detail that I was not aware of before moving into this 3D space is that regularizers are very important because if you actually just rely on point cloud losses, then your meshes will look something like crazy where faces will, will intersect and overlap. Um, and, they, and I will show examples later of why that is. So we actually need to impose some sort of constraints in order to obtain uh, smooth shapes. And uh, we use a very simple, another poor man's regularizer for, for minimizing the edge length. And for those of you that are more familiar with uh, 3D, this is another alternative would be to use a Laplacian, Laplacian loss. And we tried that, and we found that this is actually very tricky because it becomes very unstable. And those of you that know the details of a Laplacian loss, it, this is because it, the Laplacian formulation includes the area of the meshes. And when you have this free form deformation of a mesh, these areas can become really tiny. And when you take the inverse of the area, the, your loss can explode, Training doesn't work, things just go to hell, so nothing, like you can't get anything. 
And so this is all why we had to rely on something much simple for a regularizer. So if any of you has any solution to this, please talk to me because I would really like to use something that's like more correct and more uh, constructive for this work. And um, I'm just also going to give you a lot, some prior work for this task. Of course, we're not, not the first people to actually work on this uh, shape inference from 2D images. Um, but however, a lot of prior work here has a lot of limitations. For example, um, uh, a lot of state of the art is actually cannot capture varying topologies. This is because by design, their model learns to deform an initial shape such as a sphere. So then all of their predictions are actually limited to making, um, to predicting shapes that are homeomorphic to spheres. And so if you have a, if you have a donut, like a very simple example, you wouldn't be able to capture that. Uh, and other people just rely on using a, a, a base, like a, a dictionary of shapes, retrieve them and just fit the best possible shape. Again, this will not capture the unique topology of the object that you see in the image. And of course, there's some actually very exciting work uh, very recently that, has, uh, that is trying to tackle this varying topology problem. Uh, and so, th which is great. So now these people, the, these works can actually, are not constrained to making homeomorphic predictions to, to initial shape. However, in order to, to get to this final um, uh, shape, they actually rely on doing uh, like offline post-processing steps, which means that it breaks the end-to-end -end assumptions that we really, that we are striving to have. And also the training and inference time really are very different. And the reason why this is bad, actually this is not bad, but this is not bad if your goal is to actually get really nice shapes. But it is bad if you're hoping to give your model to let's say roboticists who want to attach another neural network or another model on top of your predictions and then learn something end-to-end -end for their tasks such as grasping or manipulation. Um, and, we, and that is some, somewhat like what we really hope to achieve here is to actually not just solve for this task, but make this task useful for other tasks. So having this end-to-end -end assumption is for us very important from that aspect. Okay. Um, and so, okay, I'm just gonna show some boring numbers here. Uh, so we show results on ShapeNet, which is a synthetic data set for isolated objects, but it's the most popular data set. And we show that um, you know, this, this design, again, empirical results, um, works better than prior work. Um, and more importantly, I'm just showing some visualizations here where I'm, again, showing what our model can predict versus the previous state of the R pixel to mesh, which makes predictions, as I said, by deforming a sphere. And as you can see, like, by design, this model cannot capture holes um, because there is no way that you can change the topology of the sphere by merely deforming its geometry. Um, and another really, um, the, it goes back to how important regularizers are, is that um, it is very easy to actually perform very well in this task before you remove all regularizers because the metrics are actually tuned for, um, for, for, for exactly this. Like regularizers will actually drop your performance when it comes to measuring these particular like chamfer distance. However, this is in the, in the second column I'm showing what your meshes will look like if you don't add a regularizer. You see that sort of the faces are all, all over the place. Um, there can be faces that, ex that just cross and overlap. And if you're thinking of texturing these meshes or doing some sort of nice like uh, image manipulation with them, this is not gonna work. Well, if you add a regularizer, things become a lot smoother, the faces are more regularized, they don't overlap. Um, and it creates a much smoother and like much nicer shape but it doesn't necessarily beat the, the numbers in the second column. So this is like a balance that I find really intricate and, um, and really um, bizarre. And this is another indication that we don't have really good metrics to measure whether a shape is, is good or not. Okay, so moving away from ShapeNet, we also show results on um, PIX3D, which is a very recent data set uh, from MIT, which has uh, uh, 10,000 images Nine, ob nine object categories of about 400 aligned uh, IKEA models. And why this data set is very nice is because it is actually real images of objects in real scenes with clutter occlusion. So you have all these challenges that you have for 2D object detection. And for this, 
uh, for this data set, we actually tackle the, the problem in the, um, in the detection setting, which means that we, are, we have to measure for true positives and false positives. We don't assume oracle detection. We have to detect the object, get its box, get its mask, get its shape. And thus, we have three metrics, AP box, AP mask, which are the same metrics that you have for your standard COCLA tasks, plus an added AP for the mesh. And um, on PEX3D, again, we show like some, again, some boring numbers where we compare to previous methods that we re-implemented and uh, ran on this, on this uh, task. And I'm showing you to you some results here of what our model can predict, and again, we show that we can capture these varying topologies. For example, in this bookcase, uh, there is a lot of holes and we would want to capture them, and we do. Um, but more importantly, this data set also allows us to do another, some other interesting studies. Um, and this, become, this is because of the unique nature of the annotations on PEX3D. And so while this first split, where we show results as a random split, split, we can create a much difficult split of novel shapes. So basically, we can separate our training and test set into shapes that we've not seen before in either of those. And this is because we have the underlying 3D models for the objects that are annotated, and thus we can manually construct such a hard shape. What that means is that, for example, let's say for chair, you might, you might learn the concept of a chair from looking at these two images on the train, and then on the test set, you might be asked to predict that this little stool is also a chair, even though you have never seen its shape before. Does that make sense? Okay, so now I have a question for you. What do you think in this split, how do you think 2D recognition would perform? <coughs> would it perform as, as uh, well as on the other split, which is a random split between uh, images? Would it drop? And if we would drop, how much would it drop? <coughs> oh, come on. Who said drop? How much? <laughs> okay. Embarrassingly for us 2D people, it drops by a lot. So you see that before we had an AP of mask at around 87, and now it's around a 60. This is an embarrassing number for us 2D people, which means that um, we need to do, we need to be more generalizable models. Our models do not generalize to novel shapes, which might not be um, ridiculous because our CNNs are actually good uh, memory machines. But it means that we should be able to, to predict that this stool has some similar properties in terms of affordance or other things with the chairs that I have learned from my training set. Yes? Um, <laughs> um, it seems like you're, you're doing your topological classification in cubical complexes and you're doing your surface geometry and triangular and just surfaces. Is there, um, and there's some matching problems. What, what do you mean by matching? You, you show that you've got, you have topological models, or you, you create topological models that seem to be cubical complex, right? So, 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 so we, we make an initial prediction in a cube, as you could, like, these are the voxels, basically. Um, but then you want to make, you want to deform these cubes in order to fit these nice, more like convex or con concave surfaces. Yes? And is there a reason that you wouldn't just start with? Well, the, 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 vol the volumes have to match the appearance of the object as you see it. Um, like, for example, he uh, here um, you want to match the appearance. So, if there is of the of, of every object, it's exactly like when you predict instance mass. You want to capture the appearance of the object as you see it. Uh, but what by by using these voxels, it's a very coarse prediction. So you actually want to refine it into more and the smoother shapes that can capture finer structures. <coughs> okay, yes, feel free. Um, okay, and then, and so here I'm showing some more predictions on PIX3D, uh, where on the first column you basically see the, um, uh, the object detection result, uh, like the green box is the, is the predicted box and the mass is overlaid. On the second column, you see the shape that is being rendered on top of the image just to show you that like, it is important to actually also map. Yeah, yes. I, I think you were a big bear um, on a point over 2D and 3D. Oh, yes, <laughs> you're right. 
Um, well, I guess the point is that we need, we 2D people need to work a little harder to solve this problem. And also, um, basically that, um, yes. Um, I, I guess the, the point of this was that this is something that you cannot replicate in, let's say, a data set like Coco, because in Coco you do not have any information about the shapes of the underlying objects. Well, in Pixar D, you have that information, so it creates this really nice subsets that you can study now and see how robust your models are that you cannot replicate in larger data sets. Um, so, but in terms of like the, the shape prediction, like giving you like the, you know, the rebuttal approach, like our, even in that harder split, we see gains from our method compared to others. Um, yes, great. So, uh, yes. this is, uh, uh, when you train uh, with a loss function on a existing uh, CAD model, you already have committed to a class from the master schema, no? Right, so the classes are the same. The I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about novel classes, so I see the same amount of classes, but I see different shapes across within the same class. So it's the intra-class problem that I'm talking about here. Okay. Uh, how do I have like the, whole, how much time do I have left? Oh, oh, excellent. Okay, so I'm showing here some predictions and we have more and um, I think the paper will come on Archive sometime soon so you can see a lot more example and analysis on uh, a lot of these methods. Um, but what I wanted, another point I wanted to make is that the challenges that we have in this setup for predicting shapes do not differ from the challenges that we have in 2D recognition. Occlusion is a huge problem. And as you can see in this image with the dog on the bottom, uh, when we want to predict the shape of the table, we, we, we don't see the legs, we see the top. And this is, this is what our mask predicts, this is what our shape predicts, it predicts a flat top surface, the legs are not there. Um, and this is another really important challenge that we should be able to tackle, which is amodal shape completion. And this is, again, a problem for 2D and 3D. Um, correct. So I started with giving this overview of the tasks and how they were very important into building better and better models as we go. And with the shape prediction, um, incorporating 3D information into these tasks, we're hoping that um, it will be another really nice um, it will extend this really nice uh, example of task that would lead to better, uh, to better and better models. Uh, and hopefully we can learn more by working on these 3D related um, problems. And I'm gonna now switch a little bit. Um, and, and even though we've made so much progress in these 2D tasks, like we have all these nice data sets and all these nice uh, models that we, what we do, um, there is a question that arises of whether they actually, these data that represent the world that we live in. And my answer to that is no, because our world is not just um, the visual output of a, of a person taking pictures. Um, we actually navigate in the world. We see a lot of the things that we actually see are irrelevant things that don't contain objects, such as corners or um, like the carpet. And they're important because they allow us to, to do actions. But these actual concepts are not there in our data sets because our data sets include an intelligent human that has attended to the interesting parts of the world and has captured them. And we build models now on top of that. But that doesn't mean that these models actually can perform in, in the free world when they're supposed to handle other tasks such as navigation to the goal or, um, or uh, object avoidance or whatnot. And so, so the answer is that it doesn't represent the world. And so how do we actually now go about tackling these really interesting, the same problems, but in this more freeform space? And there is this line of work that me and my colleagues have been working on for now um, two years, which is on the embodied vision, which means that you now have an agent that can see, but also can act. And it needs to, to see in order to act, and it needs to act in order to see. So it's this nice, really, loop. Um, that in order to actually recognize semantic concepts, it actually needs to get to them and attend to them. And we have this um, really nice task in this space is that this embodied question answering, where the task is a human asks a question, for example, what color is the chandelier? And an agent is placed at a random location in the environment, looking at a random scene, and has to find its way to navigate through the scene uh, by avoiding obstacles in order to attend to that part of the, of the object that it was asked to recognize and then answer um, correctly. Yeah. 
Yes, okay, great. Um, and in general, we've been, initially when we were working on this, we were working on synthetic environments, which was kind of lame uh, because they're synthetic, so they're actually not, not, do not actually represent the real world because they have the bias from the artists that have designed them. So very recently, we actually moved to more real environments, such as Matterport. Um, are you guys familiar with Matterport? Okay, some, some not, okay. So Matterport are uh, scenes, uh, it's actually a company, I think in San Francisco, that is taking sort of cameras uh, around houses. Um, and it's uh, capturing different parts of a house uh, with, with RGBD and, and LiDAR cameras. And then trying to snit and stitches it all together, creating this simulated environment so that if you want to buy this house now, you can actually click on various locations and be, and be shown around um, the house. So it's purpose of that company is basically to sell real estate by creating these really nice compelling visualizations, which we then in turn took and tried to make that into, not just us, but like the, the computer vision community took and made it into synthetic environments. And we have this paper coming out at CVPR where we study this problem by uh, fusing in uh, both R the RGB images, so uh, the visual input from these cameras, as well as the point clouds um, that these cameras represent, that these cameras capture in, for this task of embodied question answering. And basically our paper is not, not, not something super novel, but it's a really nice study and analysis of how, <coughs> how effective is these different visual modalities are. For example, if you merely look at an RGB, an RGB navigator, um, or I guess what it looks like. For example, what color is the fireplace in the bedroom? It will actually have a really hard time learning to avoid obstacles. Especially, in, remember that we don't have infinite data. The data here is very small. It's only 60 scenes per training. Um, and so merely trying to, to make free space prediction based on RGB is gonna be very hard. On the other hand, oh, why is this not playing? Okay, now this is not gonna be a the line, but, um, on the other hand, um, piece, uh, point cloud merely point cloud navigators, so navigators that only navigate with point clouds have a better time at avoiding obstacles, but are, have a much harder time in semantic understanding. And it's only when, when, um, no. And it's only when you put these things together, when you put RGB and PC and point cloud models together, that you basically get the, the both of two, uh, the, the best things of two worlds. Um, and in this really line of work uh, that we find ex exciting because it, it opens up a new set of problems and challenges for us. Mm -hmm. how, how do you train this? Like, what's the supervision? Uh, yeah, so, um, so the supervision here is uh, shortest path. So, so, the, so you, you do imitation learning first, so you learn with shortest path and then you fine tune with reinforcement learning to answer the, where the reward is basically answering the question correctly. Um, Basic, yes, yeah. And how, how does it produce like a string or does it just use a number? Like what's the output? Oh, so, so the questions are not, um, for, for this initial uh, attempt, are not freeform questions, they're templated. So you have supervision on, so you have template questions and also the answers for those questions. Okay. Um, right, and so, a lot of my colleagues and myself are very excited about this line of work, and so there, we have put a lot of engineering effort. We have a dedicated team trying to build, simulate like these simulators. And so I'm going to show a video here. It's called the Habitat Challenge. I think it has been, it will be announced soon. Um, okay, there's some cheesy music that I will mute which basically is trying to standardize the, this, um, this, the, the software stack for simulators. It's, it basically tries to push this line of work into a more a cocoa setting, where you have a server, where you up, your test set is hidden from you, you have metrics, and you upload your model there, and you measure performance, there is a leaderboard, in an effort to make this set of problems uh, more comparable across different teams. And this challenge, this, this actual, this effort actually supports a lot of data set, all the way from synthetics such as SunCG to Matterport to Richard Newcomb's like fancy, um, uh, fancy data sets. And I guess what I'm showing this video is that I feel that it's, it's something that I want to let you know of in case that you're interested in working in it. Um, 
and it is extremely fast, which is unlike many of the previous works, which is something that you want, especially if you're doing reinforcement learning. You need to work with thousands or even two, like more than that uh, uh, frames per second in order to effectively train your models. I guess I'm gonna keep showing this. There is, so, so there is, so, so there's actually, um, it's a collection of, of images, there is a mesh of the whole scene with semantic properties. So they have annotated every, um, every part, every, every triangle, let's say, of the scene. Oh yes, there is no physical properties yet. There is an effort to do that, which is obviously very hard, uh, but they want to have interactive properties with objects, like open a drawer or uh, what you said, like put something on the bench. Um, okay, no, no, no. Okay, so I want to conclude this and with a bunch of my thoughts on why we want 3D. Why is, is 3D important for um, object understanding? And as I said before, we want to enrich our 2D visual tasks in, a, in the hope that this can lead to, um, to, the, to more progress on the models that we already have for 2D. But I also secretly hope that 3D can help us with 2D in return. So can, by, by inferring shapes of objects, can we actually learn better object representations even in 2D? And finally, another secret hope that I have is that finally our models can, might be useful for um, other scientists that work in different fields, such as robotics. Um, and it is, I feel that it's, it's time for perception to move away from the static, boring uh, setting to uh, more interactive settings that roboticists have to tackle, uh, like manipulating objects or understanding whether, where to pick up an object from or how an object will deform based on its physical properties. Um, these are all hopes. I uh, hope that I will be proven right in the future. And I want to thank you. Yeah, so, so, so iteratively. So we basically refine multiple times um, for better results. So we actually, like two and three are, one is not enough, two is fine, okay. three is the same. Okay. Are, you, are you stuck with the voxels in one uh, representation and you have to merge onto the surface triangulation? I don't see the surface triangulation. Uh, the, the sur so, so, Everything I'm showing here is a mesh. It's already a, tri a triangle, like it has triangulation in space. It seemed that your meshes were cubed in the voxel. It so, so it starts with, a, with, with, little, with a, a voxel, a, a rectangular grid, like 3D grid, which is then transformed into a mesh where you can see that every, you fit a little cuboid mesh of eight vertices and 12 faces for every occupied location. So there's no, there's no voxel. And arbitrary. And this also guarantees that this cubify operation guarantees that your output is a watertight mesh, which is something that you want because if you want to like 3D print it or whatever people do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you're short this, but uh, what are the any where there were the multiple objects in the same scene? Oh, yes. Yes. I, I, I didn't show many uh, of these. Um, I had to crop so that I don't show too many, and I guess I didn't show that. But yes, we can, we can capture any sort of objects in this, like any amount of objects. And in these intermediate sets of walks of the meshes, you have both of those. Uh, yeah, so everything is a batch. So it's a batched implementation where you can predict an arbitrary amount of objects like according to what your uh, object detector uh, output. So you can output one, it can actually output zero as well, or you can output like 2,000 objects if you recognize 2,000 objects. Yeah, so it's, everything is batched. And I'm gonna say this, but implementing all these 3D operations in a batched 
way was a huge engineering challenge for me uh, and Justin. Um, like we had to write a lot of CUDA kernels in, order, in PyTorch in order to make this fast, otherwise it would take days, and now it takes like a couple hours. Yeah. Going from pixels to the actual mesh, mm -hmm. how much uh, locality do you involve uh, for every, like when you start from Berta line to graph uh -huh. every node, uh, what is the receptive field from the image that you carry to the node? How big is it? Uh, I, so I, I think that we have the computations. I don't remember now. I think that you can derive that based on the resolution of your mesh and on its connectivity. But do you go to a specific layer from uh, oh, yes, yeah. CNN? Yeah, so uh, this is an, uh, uh, an intricacy of mask or CNN where actually based on the size of the object, it, it chooses to output the feature map that has a standard size so you have like a, a set of maybe five layers that you pick which one to put, and okay. we use the same. And, and that, uh, can I continue? Okay. <laughs> so that my other question yes. is, uh, this is a semantic reconstruction. Yes. So for every class, uh, uh, there is a, uh, let's say, a regularization on the genome. So that you don't have really infinite uh, choices for all. And uh, in this sense, uh, uh, but so wait, wait, what do you mean? I mean, for a chair, the number of topologies is uh, really limited. And you, yeah. really, you really right. need a chair. Yes. The same for many other objects. Right. This is really the power of semantic uh, reconstruction. Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, uh, boxer space is uh, very sensitive to force. I mean, you, yes, you might create possible. many and we have seen it all. Why don't you just say, uh, I have a chair, might have 21 topologies, and they just fit all 21 and choose the best. Um, so you're talking about something that uses, uh, like for example, this work that's called 3D or CNN that uses a, a bank of possible shapes yeah, from example, which you yeah. choose from. Um, so, but how will you decide which, so first of all, it's ab about constructing this bank, but also, um, but, you're right that this might actually also work I mean, in this. I can classify the cut models. Uh, I see. Uh, but, right, but what if you see now a chair that you have never seen before? Like a, like the Game of Thrones chair, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be with one pole more, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I understand that, you know, like in the, sure, I mean, we might not care in this millimeter precision, but. Um, I mean, at the end, uh, uh, based on uh, the loss we're using here, does not really penalize the topology uh, error, we're not going to get so, so It, it error. will penalize the topology error. In the sense, it will not penalize explicitly, but if you, if you have a hole, but you predict a phase on top of that hole, then you will sample points from that phase. And then the chamfer distance for those corresponding points will increase. So it will capture that. But, I, but I, I like the, what you do better, and it's really a very big step uh, towards topology independence, because the other thing is R right. Uh, approach. Uh, uh, it, uh, I think, uh, it's just very sensitive to the, uh, to the box. Right. You're right. And and actually, and the other way around is also that your approach has a higher chance of actually making this amodal completion. While with the voxels, we are we're bounded by recognition failures. For example, very thin structures. If you work with mask or CNN, very thin thin structures, we can't we can't really predict them. Uh -huh. So. Um, if we can't predict thin structures and our voxels lose that, then we have no chance of recovering that layer down the, the, path, the line. But it's a very big step. I mean, I don't. All right, thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs> is, uh, who is posting the grass women uh, bunch?